All right, well, we're going to be in the Song of Solomon tonight, and uh, just kind of give you a, I guess, a brief introduction to Song of Solomon is that it is, you know, I've heard this thing taught a bunch of different ways, um, and probably you've heard it also that it's, it's the re relationship between Christ and the church, um, and it's all allegorical, and it's, to be honest, um, it's probably one of the most difficult books in the Bible. It's very poetic in its style. It does use a lot of allegory, but it is not, I personally don't think it's, the, it's talking about the relationship between Jesus and the church as much as it is the, uh, the husband and the wife relationship, um, even in the engagement part all the way up to, you know, uh, difficulties in marriage and and I think you can see that in the Song of Solomon that, that it can't be it can't be the relationship between Jesus and the church because there are some other issues in there that's specifically geared towards um, uh, you know uh, intimate relationships and and I don't think that the, you know I'm just it seems just kind of weird if you think of Jesus and the church in that kind of respect but if, uh, if you have a husband and a wife you know that is that is a part of that relationship. So anyway, I think uh, I think you'll see it kind of my way as we get through it. I'm going to do my best to uh, to help us understand it. This is about a two week long message that I'm going to do. We're going to go through the whole book of the Song of Solomon, and uh, but like I said, there is a lot of allegorical parts, and it's very poetic. And understanding what it's talking about. You know, it sometimes is a little bit more difficult to wrap your mind around. I don't know if you take notes in your in your Bible, but this would be a really good uh, book to write these down because when you read it, when you read it later and you forget what I've said, then it's like I have no idea what this is talking about. When I've read this a bunch of times, it's got some, you know, it's got some some red face uh, sections in it. That uh, you know, it because it you know it talks about it. It talks about uh, you know people's body parts sometimes and embracing and then just kind of weird, weird stuff that you think well it's inappropriate for church conversation. The problem is that it's in the Bible and all Scripture is given for our learning. So, with that being said, uh, I'm going to open us up in prayer and then uh, we will get right into it. Anybody have something specific they want us to pray for tonight? All right. Well, let's pray, dear Lord. I just want to ask that you would uh, that you'd be with us as we study your word tonight. I know this is a difficult passage, but I, I pray, Lord, that you would just give us grace and mercy and uh, guidance as we as we go through it. That we can uh, that we can think like you thought and, and understand what Solomon was trying to to give to us the lessons anyway. And uh, I just ask that you'd be with those who are you know who are not here tonight who would like to be, and that you would just and especially our grads, Lord, you know what's going on in their life. We know it's it's a season of transition and and uh, and difficult uh, sometimes to to process all the things going on at once. So I just ask that you really be over them and uh, take care of them and guide them to yourself. Uh, again, help help us tonight as we dig into your word and apply it to our lives. Jesus name, I pray. Amen. <coughs> so. Song of Solomon, let's look at the verse 1. It actually says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So Solomon is, uh, according to uh, many different sources, the wisest person who has ever lived. That was a gift from God. And he writes this song to his son. Okay? He, uh, he wants his son to understand how to have a good relationship and how to understand what's going on as he goes through the building of, of a relationship with your, your significant other, your spouse, your, hopefully your spouse in the future. And, uh, and that's, really what this is, that's really what this is about. Let's look in the first four verses there. And uh, it said, or I'm, yeah, the first four. <coughs> it says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than one because of the savor of thy good ointments. Thy name is as an ointment poured forth 
Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than one. The upright love thee. So this is, we will find out later, that this is the Shunammite woman speaking here. And she she is uh, kind of professing um, kind of kind of a, a, a word called uh, limerence. Anybody know what the word limerence means? I know that's a big syllable word, right? I probably couldn't even spell it if I didn't have it right here. But it is the state of being infatuated or obsessed with another person, typically ex experienced involuntarily. Like they can't really control how they're feeling. And it's characterized by a strong desire for reciprocation of one's feelings, but not primarily for a sexual relationship. So does, does everybody understand what that's actually saying? It's saying that she want she's she wants what she wants Solomon to give back to her what she you know how she's feeling. She's she's not asking for anything else. That she just wants him to reciprocate those type of feelings. You know to so uh, okay this is okay. Uh, I'm with you, I'm on board with this. And I think this this kind of goes back. Solomon is just kind of giving the heart of you know when. You know, Disney captured this in uh, in a term called Twitter pated. Okay, it's like they're they're just. It looks like they're messed up in the head. If you've ever seen it, it's like they do things that's outside of the norm to get the attention of the other, and they want the other to recipro reciprocate. So intoxicated. Yeah. But it was, but it's with emotion and feeling and hormones and everything. I want to show you. I want to show you a verse, and I think that this verse applies to it. There may be some people that disagree, and that's fair. I, you know, whatever. But in Genesis chapter three and verse sixteen, that part of the fall was was this was this thing that was going to. God said, you know, when they when they ate of that fruit, that God said, don't do it. Some something things about, happen. Like you would chase after him or something like that. Yeah, something like that. This is listen to what the verse says. If you're not if you're not turned there, it says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow that shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we kind of see that in the part of the fall. It's not a curse, it's just that's what happened. That there, there is a change that the that the the female part of our uh, of our population kind of gets kind of gets a little bit more emotion than, in their life than what the God does, and and I think, I mean, is that true? Okay, the ladies say it's true, so I'm going to go with them. Solomon says it's true. The actual female population up here says it's true, so I'm going to go. That that's true. I think I can I can vouch for that myself. I've seen a lot more emotion coming from ladies than I have from guys, even though they do experience some things very similar to that. But whenever it comes to a to a guy, if they get Twitter pated, okay, if they get in that state of mind, they're not the same person. And now understand this: that feeling will go away. And you just need to understand that that's what's happening. And what Limerick says is that it's it's involuntarily they can't help it. You know they're they're uh, they're just kind of they're dumb without knowing what's going on. They can't really help themselves. There's things going on inside of them that they that are they responsible? Well, here's the deal: if Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. He can help you control those things, and you won't become out of control. I've seen so many families that when their daughters hit that adolescence time in their life, the family just gets torn up because she was a good girl, and then she went crazy, and just about everybody was like, man, I don't want to deal with daughters because they've, they've seen them go that direction whenever they hit their adolescence, and they go into this state of limerence, and you can't do anything about it. You can't talk to them. I mean, they're just, they're on a level that's, 
that's very, very difficult to deal with until they get over it. And really what the best thing is, is a lot of prayer and, and hoping that Jesus can intervene in that situation. That's what, that's what the Shunammite here, I think, is talking about. And what it does is, is it's just kind of a natural thing. What's going on? They're getting ready for their next stage of life. It is good if the, if the female portion is deeply in love with her, with her husband-to-be. It is really, really good. It's not really, really good if she gets out of control and she lets him take her over and she disregards Jesus Christ and his commandments. That's not good. And, that, and, they can, and that's just kind of what it says about that. Now, when our, when we, as we, our, our, is everybody on track with me? You think I'm, 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 on, I'm on track? Okay. I don't see any heads like, you better stop while you're ahead. You know, okay. <clears throat> Look at verse 3 again. It says, Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as an, an, oint, an ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. One of the things that we see in, uh, and we're going to talk about guys too, so ladies don't think I'm picking on you. This is just her, her conversation. That she, have you noticed that it seems like girls like the guy with the reputation. Have you noticed that? It's like that that's the ones that they, you know, they get googly eyed over. They, uh, that's and the the contrast is when Jesus is when Jesus is in on board, they start thinking a little bit more about what his relationship is with Christ rather than, you know, how awesome that he is in this world. And that but but whenever those feelings hit that's typically what they look at first, and uh, you know, and it's, and we're going to talk about the guy here in a minute on on kind of what he thinks, but this is what the, this is just what Solomon is saying that she is saying. Look at verse four, again it says, "Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee, and we will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee." Sometimes, when a young lady gets into this state, she may think that she needs to give herself to him to get his feelings and his love, and may even give her uh, uh, give away um, herself promiscuously um, by enticing him with with cloth with mostly probably inappropriate clothing. Uh, these days, they, they send pictures. There's a lot of flirting that goes along along during this time. That's 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 what we see right here. That at, when they get into that state, that that's that's just something that's in the nature to start doing. So if you wonder why they dress like that, well, this is the, that's Solomon is saying that's what happens. You know whether it's good or not. Um, we're living in a fallen world, and we need to understand that, that those sort of things are going to happen. When Jesus gets in there, he, he kind of controls how our feelings are going. But if, but if you just let your feelings be, be, be driven by the world's standards, anything goes. It's like uh, the Holy Spirit acts as a filter. Right. The Holy Spirit filters these things where, well, I'm... Maybe I do have those feelings, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna flaunt myself like that. There is a standard. This morning I talked about boundaries. They've got those boundaries, and they're like, I'm not going over those boundaries, and those help control those natural things going on. It's not that those those natural feelings are bad. It's just what you do with them can be bad if you do it the wrong way. And Solomon is is talking about that. So look in verse five. As we continue on, any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me if you've got two cents. There are some comments that you want to add to it. Well, I mean, this first section is her speaking. Right, right. right. And then it's just such a strange back from verse 9 to the end of the picture. Yep, it, it is her speaking all the way down to... Uh, uh, through 8, I think. Uh, yeah, through 8. Look what it says in verse uh, 6. It says, um, oh, in verse 5, I am, I am black, but come... Calmly, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, 
Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Really what, she, what we see here in verse 5 is that um, she's concerned about her looks. She's concerned about what other people think about her. You know how many you know how many likes that they've gotten on their Instagram account. That those are things. Those are big deal things to to someone who's going through this in their life, and they don't know why they feel like that. They don't know why they're doing that. But, but in verse six, we see that you know she has regrets about those those things. She knows that they're wrong after after it's done, um, and will even warn others. Like they can see what other people are doing. That you do you don't need to do that. But they themselves will do those things and just just kind of have a sense that like they can't really they they can see wrong they sense wrong but when it comes to them doing it they can't really control themselves all that great and that's why it's important to have the holy spirit because what is one of the fruit what is the fruit of the spirit self-control right it's part of the fruit so self-control is part of the fruit of the spirit so when you let the the holy spirit guide you he will help control that. Now, that, that's for the young lady here. Look in verse 7. It says, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? This is just part of the chase. She finds somebody she's at. She would really like that person's attention. And uh, she's going she's gonna to chase him. And and then uh, she's going to even act like she's interested in what he's interested in. Why? Because she just really wants to be around him. It doesn't matter what he's doing. Anybody ever, Sean, have you ever, uh, I'm not going to ask these other guys. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, they probably experienced that too uh, as, as some lady. But, you know, maybe, you know. Whenever you and Sarah first met, was she willing to do some of the nonsense that you did just to be around? And then it, things changed when you got there? Sean was boring. It didn't matter. I think it was more of me doing the nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all's relationship is, is reversed. You know, I do want to I do want to I do want to make a, a statement here that no, I think we both did that. That well, Solomon, this isn't a you know, every woman is like this, or every guy is like this. They're going to be different, and they're going to have different things that can think about it, like control. People them. are like this. People are like this. People, right? people yeah. are tend to like, yeah. tend to be like this. Yeah, because you'll you'll do something that that you don't necessarily want to do to to try, to, especially in the when you're first courting each other's days. You know, you'll do things that that you feel like they want you to do just to right. kind of make a good impression. You, pro you probably did things that you thought that she wanted you to do, and now neither one of you do those things. Absolutely, yeah. Just because you thought. You, see, that's part of that. This is all about the, the dating process, if, for a lack of better terms. It, I can remember, um, you know, when I, was, when I was a teenager and Joy and I were, were I guess we were chasing each other a little bit, a little bit better. <laughs> uh, she'd go fishing with me all the time. She would endure the heat. She would, in, and and back then I was I was much hardier in my fishing. Like when I went, it was an all day long affair. And now uh, I've calmed down a little bit, but she's just as content to stay home or stay up at the camp. She really likes staying at the camp. You added four more people into the boat. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so sounds like you need a bigger boat. I need a bigger boat. I need a, I need a party barge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need like a <coughs> look what it look at it in verse 8 through 11 this this begins him talking and it says if thou know not O thou fairest among women go thy way forth to the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents I have compared the O my love to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels thy neck with chains of gold we will make the borders of gold with studs of silver. So he he gets here, and I, I want I want to jump back to Genesis chapter three again, and verse seventeen. 
It says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, which hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and also thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. So here we have kind of, uh, you know, kind of a salt, the man's aspect of it where, you know, he feels like he, he's, supposed to, he's supposed to do a little bit more work for her. And, uh, you know, ladies, by the way, uh, of course, there's only one here that's single. Y you need to make him work. If he's, a, if he's not a good worker, you need, to let, you need to let him go. Release that fish. He, he's bad. He's full of worms. He, he's not good to take home. He, definitely not a trophy if, he, if he's afraid to work. And he gives it in to her request and says that he will make all of her dreams come true with a perfect marriage. Maybe he thinks that. He tries to make it sound like... He just compared her to a horse. And then he's going to say our marriage will be perfect. Well, well Actually, to, to a company of horses. A company of horses. I mean, have you ever, she is you, so you know, so all, the, all those, you know, wildlife, wildlife documentaries, they show, you know, they'll show this, uh, I don't know what you call a bunch of horses, a company of horses, I guess, and they're, and they're galloping through the wilderness. What does that look like? That's a beautiful scene, right? Strong, powerful, kind of a, kind of a uh, righteous, so to speak, just majestic scene. That's what he's talking about. That he's seeing, just like those horses go through. Now, now get it. He's a man. You know, the strongest thing that he knows of. That's what he's comparing her to. So maybe he lacks, you know, good descriptions. Maybe she understood. Um, I doubt. I doubt Jacob has used those terms on any any ladies lately. You look like a company of horses. <laughs> you should try that and see how. Let me know how it turns I'm out. An old, man. <laughs> old mare, you're an old. You're not an old mare. You're just a company of horses. But but what he's saying, but he, what he's trying to do is saying that you, you know, you, a horse. That's. Uh, Maybe maybe we wouldn't use horses. We would use like uh, you know. Well, back then they were like majestic, right? Yes. Kind of right. Like horses majestic. Right. We we would we would say that she looks she she looks like a Ford Mustang. You look like a company of Ford Mustangs. You look like the Park. You look like you look like the Ford Park. <laughs> You, yeah, you got the girls that look like the Central Chevrolet dealership, and you got the ones that look like the used car dealership down the road. Uh, yeah, maybe that's what it is. You look like a brand new Ford Mustang. My wife is Elite Auto, though. Is it what? Elite Autos. Elite Autos. Elite Autos. Oh, Elite Auto. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The place where you When you get the real expensive import cars. Yeah, that, you see, that's that's really what Solomon is trying to compare. It. That's what he has to work with. He has horses. We have. You know, we have the elite auto place where you can go and you can see all the convertibles that cost, you know, a couple hundred grand a piece that you have to make a special appointment with a down payment before you can even look, walk inside. So he's trying. He's trying. And he gets down to that last part in verse 11. It says, and we will make the borders of gold with studs of silver. He promises her the world that... We can make this happen. We're going to be okay. We're going to be able to pay a pair of bills. Everything's going to work out great. And I'm going to make all your dreams come true. It's going to be perfect. Isn't that the case of, every, of just about every marriage? Young people, they don't get married thinking this is going to be an utter failure. They don't do it. They think, man, they're perfect. They're perfect. And then what do we see? Even in the church, we see 50, over 50% 50 of, the, of the members in the church have divorces and it's the same percentage outside of the church what does that mean that means that we we approach this thing of relationships wrong is really what it means and Solomon is trying to warn us he's like this is how you think it doesn't have to be completely this way yes there's some things going on that you can't really control but you don't have to give in to the flesh 
you can let the Spirit lead you. And Solomon says that in the book of Ecclesiastes. But to his son, he's just telling his son, this is how you think. This is what you're going to experience. Now, what you do with this knowledge is really going to matter in your future relationship. So, any more questions so far? Let's look at verse 12 through 17. <clears throat> and it says, While the king sitteth at his table, with my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breast. My beloved is unto me a cluster of, of camphir and the vineyards of in, in Jedi. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant also. Thy bed is green, the beams of our house are cedar and our rafters of fir. So uh, just to try to give you some understanding, spikenard is relaxing, intensely ar aromic, uh, calming fragrance. So she's saying that, that uh, I am able to calm him when he's around. I can, I can set him at ease. I can make him feel better. Myrrh is like an antiseptic. It takes the pain away. It's also used for treatment in cancer and diseases. It really, it, it, you know, um, problems seem uh, to, well, actually, she's talking to the king. She's like, when you're around, you just, you just kind of, your presence just kind of makes my problems go away. And then she uses this in Jedi. That's an oasis in the wilderness. It's a place where there's palm trees, there's water, surrounded by just desert and nothingness. And she, and she says to him, this is who you are to me. You, you're, you're when I, when I'm thirsty, you're you're with my source of refreshment. And campfire is a bundle of henna flowers, Asian shrub, reddish orange. It's used for makeup. Um, it, it can refer to an ointment. And uh, what what we see here is that you know basically he his presence just gives her a certain aura about her that just, uh, you know, you ever, you ever seen them? They just light up when that person's around. Have you ever heard that expression? That's kind of what this is referring to, I believe. And then uh, verses 16 through 17 is the prep for the marriage. Um, they, they think they're, they're ready and they're, and they're strong enough for marriage. I, wanna, I want you to look in Ecclesiastes. If you just turn back just a couple pages in your Bible. It's actually like one page in mine. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, because he, he refers to these beams of our house, our cedar, and our rafters of fur. He's referring to we're young and we're strong, we're healthy. We can make it through all these things. Now, this is, now Ecclesiastes is the old Solomon speaking back. Look what, look what he says about some very similar things in uh, verse 3 of chapter 12. And the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble... And the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. Do you, do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying the keepers of the house shall tremble. That's, that's talking about the rafters, the thing that keeps the thing standing up. He says they start shaking, they're trembling. And he, and he says the, bow, the strong men bow themselves. Have you seen some of those, those aged guys? Man, when I, my granddad, he, used, he worked on a farm his whole life. And I can remember coming back home from the Air Force. You know, I worked out every single day. I ran, I could run like, I don't know how fast I could run a mile. Uh, it was fast. It was, it was well under seven minutes. Nonstop. I could run like multiple miles in a short amount of time. My granddad, he, he picked up, he filled up two five gallon buckets and he would carry them about 200 yards from his house to the chicken house twice a day. And I'm like, Granddad, let me help you with that. He's like, you know, he's in his upper 70s at this time. And, I'm, and I try, and I'm like, my arms, they're all shaking, and I'm staggering. And I'm like, I thought I was bigger than him, but he is a strong guy. But you know what? Right before he died, he, he had shrunk. He had lost like two inches. He used to be six foot. I was taller than him now, and I'm a short guy. So I can't wait till I turn 90 how tall I'm going to be. And he and he was stooped over like this because his back his back was given in. Strong men. After you get old, 
your body deteriorates and you bow. Your body just, it just, it's just degrading. That's just part of nature. That's what happens. And then he even says the grinders, they are a few. What do you think the grinders are? Those are grinders. Those things start coming out after a while. So that's chapter one. Any questions? But Solomon and his wife, a future wife, they think we are strong enough. We can do this. We got this. Chapter two. Well, it doesn't take, in the first part, let's, let's look at uh, verses one through two. He is, Solomon is speaking here. He says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. How would you like uh, your young man to say that about himself there, Kalen? I mean, he's like, I am the lily of the valley. What does that mean? Well, he thinks he's something. He does think he's something. Have you met any guys that think they're something? Do you know any who don't think there's something? <laughs> all right, they all think they're the lily of the valley. God's gift to the ladies. We know anybody at this table who thinks like that? <laughs> <laughs> Look what it says in verse 2. He says, as the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. He's like, you know, I just want to spread my love around. I want everybody, I want, I want all those damsels to think that they're special when I'm around. I just want them to feel better. They're going through a hard time, but I can seem to make them feel better if I talk to them. Y'all know anybody like that? I'm sorry, ladies. Dudes think like that. You want me to point some out to you? I can point a bunch of them out. And, for, and I guess for a little... Yeah. Solomon's just being honest, okay? He's just being honest. You know, that, that, that's how young guys, that's how they, that's how they kind of feel. But look, look what she says in verse 3 through 7. It says, As the people of the tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay, with, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love till he please. So what we see in these verses is that we see the marriage company. She does go ahead and she marries him, even though... He has not grown up, okay? He's still immature. He's not really ready, but he thinks he is. And you know what? That is every young person who gets married, every young man who gets married. They're like that. They still have a lot of growing up to do, but they don't think so. They think, oh, I'm, I'm strong enough. I can handle it. Yeah, maybe I got some things that I can learn, but I'll learn them, and it's going to be okay. And it will be. It will be if you put your if you put your heart and your mind on Jesus Christ and you follow His commandments. It's gonna work. It will work out because you're gonna want to do what's right. But if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, times are gonna get tough. They're gonna get hard. Solomon is gonna talk about those, and you're not gonna make it. You're just not. And here's the here's the real deal. You're not as strong as what you think you are, and you're weak, and you'll give in to temptations. If you do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you don't make him Lord of your life, you'll fail. And your marriage and your relationships will collapse. And I know none of you want that to happen to you. This is, you know, this is pre-marriage counseling from Solomon that he's warning you, this is what's going to happen. You think it's okay, but if you don't trust him, if you don't let Jesus be the center of your relationship, even in marriage, it's going to have a hard road ahead. So the marriage, the marriage ceremony and the honeymoon phase, um, and she wants it to last. And you know, you see what she says down in verse seven. She says, "Daughters of Jerusalem, leave my man alone. Don't mess with him anymore. Quit, quit texting, quit text messaging him. Quit." Posting things on his uh, social media account, whatever that may be. She's trying to get him 
to her. Because here's the deal. Even though a marriage has happened, it doesn't mean that he's completely hers yet. The problem is Solomon doesn't even, he, he's admitting, I, like, I don't even really understand her yet. And you know, when you get married, you don't understand that person. It takes a while to really, really understand that person. Because remember, you're, the dating process is about limerence. It's, all that stuff is fake. It's not real. None of that's, I mean, some of it can lead up to real. But, you know, here, here in, our, in our society, we talk about love all the time, right? Marriage is, is not about love. It's about commitment. It's about truth. It's being, it's being willing to, to, to stay there when the times are the hardest and not say, well, it's hard now, so I give up. You're not a, no, you don't get to quit. But in our society, it's just like, well, I don't love them anymore. It was never supposed to be about love. It was supposed to be about truth. Is this somebody that God values as much as he values you? You, whenever you say a marriage vow, do you understand what that is? It's not a contract. It's a covenant. It's a death do you part. So it's a death do you part thing. And that's what you, that's what you have to go in with. And you're like, whatever we need to do to make it work, we're willing. And that covenant's not just between you and her, it's between you, her, and God. That covenant is between you and God. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you don't get out of it until God dies or you die. Is, is really, and, and her or him, of course, that all three of you are yeah. a part of that covenant agreement. And that's, you know, that is, you know, we don't, I'm having, I'm having this conversation with you. I feel like it's important. Um, but honestly, this has been a hard, this, this is hard for me to get into because, I don't know, it's difficult. Because I understand the way our culture thinks and it, con it counters our current culture. Like if you go, if you go probably, you know, Jacob, if you probably go tell your parents what I said tonight, they're like, you got a crazy preacher. And you know what? And I'll tell them, you know what? I agree. Because what, what God has given as truth is, I mean, show me, show me in the New Testament where Jesus gave his teachings and it was accepted. It, it wasn't. It was, in fact, he got so bad that they wanted to kill him for it. The devil does not want you guys to know the truth. He doesn't want you to have successful marriages. In fact, what he's going to do is he's going to, before you're even married, he's going to attack that part of your life. He's going to try to get you to mess around with other, with other people. He's going to try to get you involved in, in things that you do not need to be involved with, whether you're looking or pictures or whatever he wants you to do that because he knows if i can get them tapped into that i've always got a leash on them it's about the devil whenever he does those things it's about slavery okay he wants you to be a slave jesus said i want you to be made free but the devil wants to be able to control you and he's really good at that because well to be honest, God made us to be uh, to have some limerence issues in our life. I was going to say that verse seven. You know, we've been going a lot over a lot of this stuff in our Bible study with the family, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the other versions that it states it this way: it says, "Do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time." And the way that they taught that to do the study was to have accountability with your friends, like it's saying, talking to your daughters, to mm -hmm. help me not to pursue things that would create intimacy too soon until before marriage. So I just want to point that out. So that's another way to look at that. Yeah. Well, either either way, I think it would work. Um, that they don't mess they don't mess with Solomon, but at the same time, they hold her accountable for uh, to make sure that she doesn't have wandering eyes herself. Or to think, well, he's he's not the superhero that I thought thought he was. Oh, it was just using that as you shouldn't let yourself get too comfortable, touchy, basically. 
because actually you can say, you know, yeah. things that you shouldn't do. I sure could. And that, that's kind of the way they put that right Let's look at uh, verse 8 through 13. I don't think it'll take much of the time to get through the rest of this. It says, The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Can you picture that? Can you picture Sean doing that, Sarah? <laughs> my beloved is like a roe. That's, that's like a deer. Or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the, at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. So, let me see. Let's look at it. Continue down to verse 13. <clears throat> my beloved spake, and he said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. I want you to uh, recognize right there that the, the season has changed in the storyline. Winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of the birds has come. And the voice of the turtle, is, and that's a turtle dove, not just, I don't know if you've ever heard turtles say noises. They don't make much noise. Is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the, and the vines with tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So she, uh, she speaks. She kind of quotes him. But there's a change in the season. You know what the change of the season is? The honeymoon is over. And then regular life starts to kick in, and then everyday problems start in. When springtime gets, well, work has to get, you have to get back to work. You know, back in their, in their culture, they had a lot of farming going on. You gotta get back to the fields. You, you've gotta leave the house. You can't devote as much time to each other. So uh, you gotta go back to work. You gotta do what's necessary to survive. Well, when, uh, when you start facing real, the real life and everyday problems start uh, getting in, what, we, what we're gonna see is that they are, they're kinda drawing away from each other, not on purpose, it's unintentionally, and with, just because of everyday duties. I've got a job to do, okay? That means that you do have to leave. You gotta go take care of business. You're gonna be gone for a little bit, those, when that happens, some feelings, some things start to change. It really starts to become a lot more real. And you find out, what was your love initially? Was it really love, like agape love, like the way that God loves us? Or was it more like a lustful love? And really, whenever you're beginning a relationship like that, it's really hard to distinguish what the difference is. Because you're just, you know, you're like... Ah, you're like Bambi, you know, your Twitter page. You kind of don't know what's really going on. Look at verse 14 and 15. He says, O my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. What we see here is both are kind of staying away from each other, but they're both desiring each other. They're thinking about each other as they are as they are separated, but they have something that comes in to mess with their life. The little foxes. What do you think the little foxes are? Those little those things eating the, the tender grapes before they're ripe. Okay, I'll just give it to you. Nobody's, their problems, their, their arguments that happen, they have, they, have these, they have these little foxes, these arguments that are causing problems, and they're kind of getting on each other's nerves a little bit. They're starting to push each other's buttons because now you don't have limerence that's kind of overshadowing these things that were annoying to you to begin with, but now you're starting to see you know, how she is or how he is, you know, man, he talks a lot in his sleep. Wow, I didn't know she actually snored. Why does she have to take up the whole bed? Why does she need like 10 pillows? Why can't he put the toilet seat down? Those type of things are just little foxes, but they start nipping at all the little tender grapes in your life. 
And though one problem might not be an issue, but you start piling it on, you, those little issues start becoming big things. And then you're going to have arguments, and the argument is never going to be about what is really causing the problem. Does that make sense? That is just, that's the truth of life. Now, if you can understand that when you get into it, you know, whenever, you know one day you're going to have an argument with somebody that you really care about, and you're like, look, what is really the problem? What is really going on? I know it's really not about me leaving the toilet seat up. What's going on? And dig a little bit deeper. All those other things are just symptoms of something bigger that's going on. And really what it is, is it's just life kicking in. And you, ha you two haven't grown up together. You're not used to each other. You're learning each other. You're, gro you're literally, you're growing up together. You're raising each other. That, that is the truth of what's going on in this new established relationship. Does that make sense? That you really do have to just kind of grow. You, when two become one, have you, ever, have you ever seen that on trees? How two trees have become one tree? They could even be separate trees. But eventually, as they grow together, the bark just kind of envelops each other. You see, that's what you're, that's what you're gonna do as a marriage. But it doesn't start out like that. It has to grow like that. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of understanding, being willing to understand that person better and giving 100%. But you're like, Brother Mitch, it's a 50-50, right? They give 50, I give 50? Look, if you don't give 100% and she doesn't give 100%, it's gonna fail 100%. That is, where the relationship is going to be headed. And you see what Solomon does? He doesn't like the he doesn't like the arguments. He really doesn't want to deal with the I don't want to deal with this right now. And that's and that's guys, okay? Ladies, that's guys. When you're like, when you start saying, "Well, you you do this, you do this, you do this," he's either going to say, he's either going to revert back and start accusing you and, and sharing with you all of the buttons that you push in his life or he's gonna like or he's gonna or he's gonna get away from you. You're gonna push him away when, by doing that because he doesn't want to deal with that. Solomon says that. Look what he says in verse 16. My beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. So what does he do? He's like I'm going I'm going out there. I, yeah I'm married I'm married to her but the little foxes are causing problems in our life. I'm going to go where life is a little bit more simple. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go where I like. You see, back back in the first part of that uh, that passage, you remember, he thought that he was the lily of the valley. You remember that part? Mm -hmm. And as the lily among the thorns, so he goes back to all those other lilies, because there's going to be some other lady out there that's not going to that's not going to mess with him like that. So that's why it's important to be careful and to understand to understand what's really going on with him at the same time. And if you if you just communication, it's going to be communication. If you do not, if you're not willing to talk about the truth, it's not going to work out. You have to be honest, and you have to. And you're like, how do, how do we approach this? He does get into this later on. We're not going to get into all of it tonight, how to deal with it. But look at verse 17. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountain of Bethar. So how long is he going to be gone? Until he thinks it's safe to return. If he thinks, if he thinks that there's conflict waiting for him, he's, he... He's, gonna, he's not going to want to be a part of that. And for guys, you need to recognize that about yourself. Don't, don't, run, don't run from the problems. You know, you might, you, you, you might have to say, look, what is really going on? Let's talk about this. Let's really talk about this. I know we're still new at this. We're growing together. And be willing to calmly, and that's, and that's going to be the issue. you got to... You can't reason with somebody that's out of control. You have to say, all right, let's reason together. That's what God says to you. 
And Isaiah 1, 18, he says, come and let us reason together. What you two will need to do is to come and reason together. How can we fix this? If you fix it while the foxes are little, you can save it. You can prevent the little foxes from coming in. It's not that hard to put a toilet seat down. It's not. In fact, it's not even that hard to clean it up before you leave. If that's what bothers her. And you really say, well, what is really, well, I need you to spend more time with me. And I know I'm probably preaching to myself. I'm going to hear on the way home. <laughs> just because, you know, just because you know it doesn't mean it's easy to do. And it's a lot of work. And it takes a lot of honesty on both sides to be able to make it happen. That is to chapter 2 of the Song of Songs. Anybody got any follow-up statements, comments, questions? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. And if y'all do want to talk to me about it, y'all can. I'm like, I don't, this is, I've never heard Solomon, Song of Solomon talk like this. This is, this is from my personal study. Uh, and Brother Sean studied with me a little bit on this. So, nothing? All right, dear Lord, guide us in your love. Help us to understand you and help us to understand each other. And I do pray for uh, the relationships that do happen in these young people's lives. I know there's several here tonight. There's relationships in their future. I ask that you would just help them, Lord, to seek your face and to honor you with their lives. Lord, there, there's a couple of us who are married here. That you would help us in our relationships that we can overcome those, those hard things in life and that we can get past the problems and that we can just honor you with our marriages and teach the children that, that result from these your ways and your commandments. Guide us in this understanding and your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.